Hey everybody, before we start this episode of Tabletop Babble, I just wanted to let you know that our guests in this episode, Rich Howard and Darcy Ross, myself and Dan Dillon and the one and only Aram from God's Fall, got together and actually played in a D&D aquatic adventure that Rich Howard wrote and ran. There were all sorts of original races. It was super fun. Uh, I was a were shark monk, uh, and there were so many other cool things going on. If you want to check it out, it will be released as a podcast eventually, but you can see it right now on our Twitch channel at twitch.tv slash don't split the podcast. That's twitch.tv slash don't split the podcast. All right. Let's start the show. Hey everybody, it's Rudy Basso, the co-owner of Don't Split the Podcast Network. I would like to encourage you, lovely listener, to head on over to our website and give a listen to my show that I host with my brother called Game O'Clock. It is a video game retrospective, introspective, other spectives, all about the kind of games that we love. And to be honest, we love just about every game out there. Game O'Clock released every Thursday. It's fun, it's short, and hey, you'll probably learn something about video games. This is Tabletop Babble. I'm James Intricasso. You know, I don't know about you, but I find aquatic adventures, you know, like the underwater kind, particularly difficult to run. That's why today on the show I have Rich Howard and Darcy Ross, two amazing game designers, two amazing game masters, two amazing scientists on the show to talk with me about the best way to run an underwater adventure and what makes them so amazing and awesome. Uh, Hear us geek out about all kinds of great creatures in the conversation coming up right now. All right, so now I'm here with two amazing people, Rich Howard and Darcy Ross. Both of them have last names that are common first names as well. (laughs) It is exciting to have you guys here giants in the role-playing game industry, uh, <laughs> scientific minds. Uh, you guys are, are brilliant. Why don't you tell the people, if they haven't heard of you before, uh, what you do in the world of tabletop RPGs and in the world of aquatic endeavors. Uh, Rich Howard, let's start with you. I'm b- Based on that intro, I'm starting to wonder if you got the right two people on the show. Yeah, I'm, like, I'm not yeah. sure. <laughs> <laughs> But I guess we're here. So the first question uh, is right at the moment, (laughs) I'm like on an inadvertent hiatus, it seems like. I've been sick with my family for very, for like six weeks. So I feel like I'm really behind on deadlines. But personally, I do some uh, conversions, mostly from Pathfinder to fifth edition. Work is what I'm doing right now. I'm working with Misfit Studios and Christina Styles Presents and Rogue Genius Games and Legendary Games, trying to help kind of behind the scenes with them doing their work on 5e work. In addition to that, I am a periodic columnist on tribality.com. I have a ton of articles that are already sitting there waiting to be used, including my um, column from the depths, which uh, ties into our subject today. Um, I'm hoping to get back to that again uh, a little bit more. And then uh, aside from that, I'm also the co-host of a podcast called Whelmed, the Young Justice Files where we break down the brilliant DC animated series Young Justice, but we use it as a springboard to talk about storytelling across the board. And my co-host is the Caleb G from the RPG Academy. And so role-playing games definitely get discussed in our super geekery over there. So Yes, an excellent show about an excellent show. Oh, <laughs> thanks. Darcy's been on there too, actually. Actually, the reason we I have did. a show is be- is because of Darcy. <laughs> Darcy, because of my Darcy, astounding <laughs> ignorance. <laughs> Darcy, Darcy made us make a podcast. Thanks, yes. Darcy. Yeah, I thank you guys. <laughs> and the reason I love the ocean is because I grew up landlocked in a small town in Kentucky, and the ocean is like an alien planet that you can basically explore right here. I remember the first time I saw the ocean, the real ocean, and my brain could not process what was happening. It's just... <laughs> too vast i didn't i was like i've never seen anything that i could not see the other side of so it reprogrammed my brain 
Yeah, I can't wait to uh, film that scene in the biopic that is the Rich Howard story. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, Darcy, what about you? What do you do in the world of tabletop role-playing games, and uh, how do you feel about the ocean? <laughs> so uh, I'm a bit of a dilettante all over doing different things in uh, role-playing games, but mostly what I do is I blog a little bit for Gnome Stew, and lately I've mostly been interviewing people uh, about creative projects they're doing just because there's so much good uh, stuff happening uh, in the world of RPGs right now. So that's been really fun. I also podcast with my awesome podner Troy Pidgelman on Cypher Speak, which is a podcast about the material that comes out of Monty Cook Games, which is uh, the group that produces games like Numenera and The Strange. Numenera deals with aquatic life and alien life and life in general and natural history in really interesting, cool ways. So I've, it's always been very dear to my heart. And then I also work a lot with Contessa, an organization. Its purpose was to support and highlight uh, women in leadership and roles in gaming. So women designers, GMs, community organizers, artists, things like that. Um, but this year, I'm really excited because we're expanding to support all sorts of marginalized voices in gaming. So we work a lot at Gen Con to sort of have a con within a con. Um, and I'm really proud of and love that work. And I'm kind of knee deep in getting all that organized right now. I write a little bit. Um, I'm sort of, that's nascent sort of content. So I'm a contributor on Tales of the Warrior Princesses, which is kickstarting now, but maybe not now when this releases. <laughs> but it, it was a really cool project. So I wrote an adventure. I just backed that, actually. It uh -oh. looks awesome. Thank you. It has a, an underwater adventure in it and a sort of seafaring swashbuckling deal. So I, this stuff has been on my mind, which has been great. And why I love the ocean, uh, so I, I sort of came at the ocean sideways. I also grew up in a small suburban town that uh, was pretty much depauperate of any real life. Uh, <laughs> um, I don't think I had seen a snail until I started to study them for my PhD work. I, I don't think I had seen one, which is shocking, <laughs> but it, I don't think I had. You know, once I discovered that I wanted to study snails, I started to realize the diversity of life that I had been missing out on. And, you know, so much of it is, is aquatic. So that's always been very exciting to me. And, you know, I don't just love the ocean. I also love, uh, you know, I think fresh water gets a bad rap, but I'm sort of in love with like horrible little ostracods and, and little uh, <laughs> invertebrates that live in fresh waters too. They're terrifying and great. <laughs> so uh, I dig it. Um, yeah. And I just think that uh, the more I study you know, and find out about marine life, especially the more I realize that everything, you know, everything I've been doing to try to make the weirdest monsters possible is paling in comparison to what's actually out there, which is fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> that is absolutely true. I, I back yeah. that um, statement. Excellent. Well, the reason I have asked you both on today is because I want to talk about aquatic adventures. And I want to talk about aquatic adventures because I, as a GM, am scared of aquatic adventures. And I have heard mm. other people repeat the same sentiment. Um, Mike Shea has often said underwater adventures suck. And he means from a, mm. from a design standpoint that designing and running them is, is difficult. I was about ready to just give him a call, man. <laughs> I'm going to go to, what is that all about? I have to go toe to toe with Mike Shea. <laughs> well, this podcast is, is for him and it's for me. It's to, it's to help us understand sort of how can we make, the greatest aquatic adventures. How can we run great aquatic games? But I think to do that, we need to define what makes an aquatic adventure. Uh, can it take place just on a boat? Do we need to actually spend a majority of our time underwater? Because that's the scary thing. The, the underwater part is scary. I know how to write an adventure on a boat. That's just land that moves like a boat is is easy to do so it, it, for me it's like the big underwater thing is what makes an aquatic adventure an aquatic adventure what do you think makes one uh and rich why don't we start with you yeah i mean i've, I've been pretty clear on other podcasts that i know i do not believe that pirate and sailing adventures are aquatic adventures i mean it certainly makes it more convenient to squeeze in aquatic encounters um, and it's not a bad place to start to dip your toe in, so to speak, to aquatic gaming. But when I talk about aquatic gaming, that's, you know, being on a boat and then going from island to island isn't really what I'm talking about. Not that they can't be great and have a ton of fun. I mean, I've been watching now that we've got Moana. Mm. My kids are watching it a ton and mostly they're watching it because I tell them we're going to watch it because I want to watch <laughs> it. 
but there's a lot of great stuff in there that you can pull for aquatic adventures. So I certainly wouldn't say that, you know, you're doing an aquatic game wrong if you were doing like a Moana campaign. But when I'm talking aquatic campaigns, I'm talking about entire cultures and civilizations and adventures that are entirely submerged. That's what I think of when I'm talking aquatic campaigns. What about you, Darcy? What do you think makes an aquatic campaign or, or adventure? Yeah, I, I think the the majority of the challenges really come into play once you are totally submerged, right? I think that properly utilizing how you get to that state, you could really set yourself up for, you know, the tension or or excitement, you know, as you're on the ship or as you're in the submergine or if you're in these underwater tubes, but, you know, you're looking out at what possibilities are all around you. Um, so I think that's kind of a fun way to set it up, but I definitely think the real challenges come once you're actually in the water or once you're in the weird viscous fluid. The first underwater adventure I ran was on the moon because in my Numenera game, the moon is a fully enclosed um, aquatic environment that the cephalopods went to uh, long, long ago. So that was fun. I'm, I'm sorry. I just have, I have to pause right there to tell you how like viscerally happy that statement just made me i don't i don't know how to express like how happy i am in that there's something in the world that is what you just said oh man someday i'm gonna have to run uh some of those adventures for you rich because they were pretty great <laughs> well you you ran one game that had me in it for a numenera game and you made a pregen That's a pregen true. for me that made me so happy oh yeah i had a <laughs> oh, i forgot about the pregen so I had this I had this animal companion or something. What would you call it in Numenera? Just an animal companion? Yeah, close enough. So the way that the the, the stuff works in, in Numenera is that things have certain levels, right? So it's like a third level companion or whatever. But as my companion got hit, like their effective level basically goes down. So the more they get hit, the less effective they are in combat. And in what we what we pictured was it was basically like a f- it was a it was a giant like floating above water jellyfish, right? And yeah. each time it got hit, its level went down because it literally got cut in half. And it it, <laughs> it was the more it got the more it got damaged, it would turn into like this swarm of smaller <laughs> jellyfish that just weren't as effective, but they weren't gone. And it was just created this like visual craziness that Numenera is so good at doing. Yeah, it was just <laughs> it was just amazing. I loved every second of it. It was awesome. Oh, man, so much of my Numenera weirdness is just cheating and taking something that should be underwater and putting it above land, on land. Marine life is so weird that just doing that is like cruise control for weird. <laughs> if you guys get a change, you should listen to Darcy run Numenera on One Shot, the One Shot Podcast Network. Mm, ah, thank yes, you. great episode. That thing got bonkers. Bonkers. <laughs> <laughs> accurate <laughs> so darcy then uh, you know we're talking about it already why are underwater adventures great like why should someone like me who fears the great deep why should i run an underwater game what what am i missing out on oh man uh there, there's a lot to unpack here that i'm sure rich and i can start to attack uh for me one of the big things is just especially in a game you know maybe a D game or something where you're used to a certain suite of oh, we're running into kobolds or we're running into gnolls or bugbears or, um, you know, dragons even. Taking things under the water, it just adds that your comfort zone should change in so many ways. And one of those ways should be the expectations of what you could encounter there are totally opened, right? There should be all sorts of weird critters that you don't know how to deal with, you know, you as a player and you as your, as, as your character too. Everything's better with tentacles is my <laughs> official stance. <laughs> And you really get away with that easier when you go underwater. <laughs> All right. That's a t-shirt. <laughs> Perfect. So definitely diversity of animals is one thing. I don't know if we should popcorn back and forth, Rich. Oh, no. I, I mean, I, I can echo that. I mean, everything underwater is new, mm -hmm. right? So even if you look at a standard like non-aquatic system like Dungeons and Dragons, take a look at your monster manual and look at how many amazing aquatic monsters or yeah. just creatures like dragons that are can breathe water that are in there, and how many of them don't you use? Oh my like, god, so many! They're they're in yeah. every standard. You know what I'm saying? There's so many, and it, and D and D isn't even. I mean, the best fifth edition D and D aquatic rules is like one three sentence paragraph mm -hmm. about how <laughs> if you have a swim swim speed, then you're not limited with what weapons you can use, or something ridiculous that doesn't make any yeah. sense to me. 
but that's pretty <laughs> much it. Like they don't have any other rules yet. Somehow you've got you've got marrow and you've got Aboleth and you've got dragon turtles and you've got all this stuff in it. Oh yeah, right. But then yeah. if you think about it, then mm-hmm. when you get into a setting or a system like the Blue Planet science fiction RPG setting from Biohazard Games or the absolutely go buy it yesterday brilliant Into the Deep, which is the new Monera. That uh, thing, that yes. thing is so good. I don't care what you're running. Go buy that book and read it. <laughs> I, I can't read it right now because it makes me like weepy I know, with right? how like good it is. Like it like moves me and so I haven't finished it It's all. so good Ugh. because you read like three pages of it and then you have to sit and absorb all of the ideas that yes. are coming off in your head about what you can do. Like no joke, man. I mean, Monty Cook Games, of course, does good stuff. But this Into the Deep, I, I'm feeling like... I'm pretty well versed in aquatic gaming. <laughs> so <laughs> when I picked up Into the Deep, I expected to find a couple of interesting things. I didn't expect to find interesting things on every freaking page that makes me make turns my head upside yeah. down. So go by that. Or Cerulean Seas, which is a hugely diverse, really cool, actually post apocalyptic setting for Pathfinder. Where the where the mm. entire world has been, uh, all the oceans have risen due to this magical apocalypse, and there's very few surface races, and everything is aquatic. My point is, is that you start getting into these systems that really dive into having this unique environment, and if you think about what kind of cool stuff you have in a non-aquatic game like D anD D, and then you start looking at these other games, man, you're going to take your your forty year grognar D anD D player or whatever. And throw them into this environment, and they are not going to know what's going on. They're going to feel like a complete, a yeah. complete newbie getting into their game, and it's going to make so much of everything so fresh. Part of the fun building off of that, I think, is like I don't know. It's just it's such a different environment that when you look at your your character sheet, right, and the spells you have and the tools you have, uh, you have to think about using them differently. And there's kind of new cool opportunities to think of uses for spells that you never thought, right. you know, that you've never thought of before, right? Um, and so, you know, whenever I play d and I'm, I'm especially like a utility spell person. I'm totally useless. Never take me in your party. But I love thinking of those kind of creative uses for spells and equipment and uh putting people in such a different environment means there's new opportunities for that it may require a lot of like head scratching by the gm of should that spell work down there or you know how would that work really but uh as long as you rule of cool it or you know have thought about it a little bit beforehand i think it works out and there's definitely some systems that feed into that a little better i think i mean pathfinder has a lot of rules to it it's pretty rules heavy but i think it works a little better in in a system like 5e being underwater because you can do a little bit more theater of the mind and, you know, kind of, kind of rule yeah. cool it. And it's not as much, you know, like, okay, I'm sliding five feet this direction, you know, even fourth edition, it was, it was very tactical in a way that I, could be a little weird underwater. Now, having said that Cerulean Seas is a Pathfinder setting and it's got a ton of great rules and ideas for things like 3d movement and environments and stuff like that, that we can talk about later. But when you have a system like D&D 5e or Numenera or um, the Fantasy Flights storytelling stuff for Star Wars, those things that you can you can either use miniatures or not, and that gives you some freedom to be able to you know mm-hmm. move a little easier. Well, and I think that's great. Like the idea of new, and I think you know you hit it on the head when you guys were talking about even within D and D, which isn't one of these specialized systems. Like I don't know that I've ever used. Sahuagin? I'm not even sure if I'm saying that correctly. Like, that's how... Yeah. I've, they're, they're like weird fish lizard people. And they're so cool. They, they have, like, this whole cool society <laughs> and everything. And I, I don't think I've ever, as a player or as a DM, encountered them. And I was sort of like, I should use these. I, I should use these in something. And why am I not? You know, and then, Rich, you've run games for me. Unfortunately, I've never had the the pleasure of a Darcy Ross game, but I have had the pleasure of a Rich Howard game. And it had some great underwater elements in it. It was amazing. And so I want to know why are people like me scared? I know for me, it's like you guys are talking about it's new, it's different. But to me, I worry about those things, right? I worry about like... Oh, the the physics of a lightning bolt spell underwater or or like how do I, even if I'm not playing D and D, you know, if I'm if I'm playing something else, maybe even something that's tailored for that, like, ah, oh, you know, you're in this 3D environment and obviously you're always in a 3D environment in your brain, but like 
you know, you can move that way and then like people can't breathe. So do I need to worry about managing how you breathe under like, you know, all of that stuff. I, I sort of start to get jumbled up. How do the physics work? How does the lack of resources work? What's down there that I don't know about because I am not a scientist. Like, how do I make the most out of this game and how do I get myself comfortable so that my players can be comfortable? Why do you think people are afraid I think you just gave like a giant paragraph of all the reasons why people are afraid. <laughs> like, and, and, and some of it, it, it's really unfamiliarity with the environment and, and I, I get it and it's okay. But like things like, oh, well, it's a 3d environment. And I'm like, okay, well, um, all of your cities, then the maps that you put your characters on in a D and D game are all two dimensional. I mean, no, you have buildings and you have, you just have to think about these things a little differently. I mean, if you have characters who are flying in a, in a tabletop game, then it's not that much different than characters who are swimming. Now, I mean, it's a little different, of course, but I don't think it's as different as people think they, they are. And there are things out there to help you with tools. Now, again, you can theater the mind some of it with some systems. Cerulean Seas has a really cool like leveling, like leveled platform things that you can just build in mass to do stuff. I mean, there, there are some physics and things you have to look at, but you have to kind of decide what you need to worry about and what you don't need to worry about. And I think that's where people get a little sketchy, right? Like pressure is enormous, right? Now you you were just making, you were just talking about the game I ran for you, James. I actually ran that same game for Darcy as well. I, I run for those of you who don't know, every year at um, Gen Con, I run it, an aquatic-themed Star Wars Edge of the Empire game for gaming industry and podcast people, kind of like my way of saying thank you. And Jim McClure from Talking Tabletop was in one of those games, and he talked about it afterwards, and there's a scene where the players are like 200 meters you know, below the surface, and that's the edge of what's called the photic zone, where light is pretty much non-existent or getting very close to that. And they're in a tiny little cramped field research station. And what he had said was, he said, like, his imagination was running away with itself, right? Because the pressure there is like 20 times that on the surface. And he said it gave him this, like, physical, tactile sense of environmental dread that if that, if that space collapsed, he was going to die. And this isn't, like, an orc you can kill. This is the environment around you trying to kill you, right? And he said it, it's a different kind of dread than he gets from, say, like being in a, say, a spaceship in space that's, you know, out of gas or whatever. And if you think about, like, the pressure difference between being inside a spaceship and outside a spaceship, the difference is one atmosphere of pressure, right? There's no atmospheres in space, and there's one atmosphere in the spaceship, right? But the bottom of the Marianas Trench is over a thousand atmospheres of pressure, right? I mean, even in the 200 meters I had you guys down, it's still 20 times that on the surface. And I think not knowing that or not knowing how to handle that is something that people get intimidated by, but really you just need to figure out, do you need to worry about it, right? If you're in a magic game, you don't really need to worry about it that much. You know, you can or can't, you can make those choices, but everybody's walked through a city on the surface. Some people, nope, not everybody's climbed a mountain, but you can envision that because it's part of your everyday life of watching media. So my answer to, the, to your question kind of, James, is we have a ton of really cool media out there. Go watch Blue Planet. Go watch Aliens from the Deep. Go watch all of these cool documentaries that show underwater lakes underwater lakes it's a terrifying thought and i love it right hydrothermal vent fields that spew this poisonous gas out and like there's all of these really cool things or just a dead carcass of a giant whale that's fallen down to the darkness right and use those things screenshots or whatever audio recordings of you know submarines under underwater things like that to to help give the feel of things that you might not be able to describe yourself because you don't have firsthand experience the more you can immerse your players into using their own imagination with sounds and visuals and stuff like that, the less work you have to do as a, as a GM, right? They can let their imagination run away with them. Yeah. I, I think I'm going to split two fears that, quite frankly, I still have. You know, it's still very different from what I'm used to GMing, right? And so I think there's the sort of mechanical fears of like, okay, how do we deal with, you know, what does, you know, if they pull a spell out that I haven't thought of, like, 
you know, there's kind of an anxiety about, oh, does that work down here? Have we have we decided we care about verbal versus somatic components? <laughs> yeah, that's a big one. Yeah. So there's this whole suite of like mechanical concerns that I think are valid and you can kind of make some calls on stuff you want to care about versus stuff you want to hand wave. I think if you hand wave it all, it kind of loses some of the cool tension that you can right. play with. Uh-huh. Uh, so I, I don't, I do encourage keeping some of that in there, even though it is a bit of work for the jam. But so there's these mechanical concerns, but there's also like narrative concerns, which I think is also what um, what you're talking about, Rich, where like if you are having players go through a dungeon crawl, there are little enclosed rooms. We've all been in a room. We know what a room is. We can talk about paintings on the room. We know what <laughs> sorts of things could possibly exist in this room versus the vast, impossible nature of the giant ocean, which when I think about it initially, you know, as a, as a concept, it seems just vast and impenetrable and uniform, right? Which it, which it actually isn't, but you need you need those visuals and those those immersions of in documentaries and things to think about, okay, so in this part of the ocean, we could have the underwater lake, or here we have a kelp forest, or here we have, you know, a cave network, or, um, you know, these ways to these things that could exist down there that help you narrate the environment around the players. And so I think that's been kind of important for me. And, you know, also just like creatures that you can throw in. And so one thing that I would probably do again in the future is kind of write down a little list of things players find as they move throughout our space, right? So just little set dressing details to include just so it doesn't feel samey, just because it's it's a lot more work to describe places that we haven't spent as much time in, right? And also just talking about the navigation down there, right, is a little weird, uh, especially, you know, if you're theory of the minding it. Um, I'm reminded of like Ender's game, the enemy's base is down, right? So you like, you kind of, a- you have to anchor yourself in different ways. So especially for combat, you know, if you're going to set up a cool set piece combat encounter, you may want to be really specific about you know, off to the side, there's a big column of, of like weathered, st- you know, a weathered stone pillar, right? You just may want to anchor it in ways that make this 3D nature more accessible. I think. That, that's actually, sorry, that's a really good example. That training exercise in Ender's Game is a really good mm-hmm. way of looking at like training your brain to think about things in a 3D mobile environment. Mm-hmm. Um, that's a fantastic visual, actually. So training training yourself to be able to look at it, like we don't worry about you know, the subtleties of what I need to point out or not point out when we're walking through a city on the surface. We know enough to know what we don't need to focus on. But when you're underwater, you don't know enough to know what you don't need to focus on when you're underwater. Right. Great point. Uh, just because of experience. But there are things you can draw on to to give you that. And and I think both Darcy and I would both say that the, the investment of time and, and energy, which isn't as much as you might think to be able to, you know, get your players into this environment is absolutely worth it. Yeah. uh, Documentaries are really accessible. There's a ton streaming all the time, you know, images, like you said. And also if you have the the time, the means and the location, an aquarium is, is a pretty great way to do it or some kind of natural history museum, even Uh, just walking by things like that is is great for inspiration. Um, And just if you, if an aquarium, especially if you can just get that feeling of being surrounded by water, I think that's, that goes a long way to like feeling comfortable in describing yeah. it, at least for me. And and you can also not not worry about going so far deep or out into the far ocean, right? Because when you get out into the deep, when you get out mm. into the deep ocean, that's basically the equivalent of the ocean's desert, right? There's nothing out there. Yeah. So the only things that live out there are enormous things and really, really fast things <laughs> that have to go from point A to point B, right? <laughs> Now that's hard to describe and wrap our brain around because we not many of us have had that experience, but you don't need to go that far. I mean, you, if you limit yourself to a hundred feet or two hundred feet deep, you don't need to worry about things like light. You can hand wave things like pressure, right? You don't need mm-hmm. to think about that as much, but you can still have fascinating encounters in coral reef, you know, cave structures, and you know that kind of stuff. And so you don't need to don't don't jump into the deep end literally you know so early you can ease your way into it and kind of just experiment yeah yeah and that makes sense to me you know thinking about like if i didn't know anything about ancient rome and i wanted to run a campaign world based off ancient rome what would i do i would go check out uh you know documentaries i would read books uh i might go to an ancient roman museum right if i if i had access to such a thing uh i might watch gladiator uh you know similarly you might want to watch like 
the abyss or sphere or yep. water world, um, you know, to, to get some ideas. Uh, I wish that I had named some good movies, but uh, no, the abyss is fantastic. I, I do highly recommend the abyss. Yeah. The abyss, is, the abyss good. is a good one. Get the extended full director's cut version though, or the end won't make any sense. <laughs> um, but that's actually a really great idea too. And they're not actually out in the water very much. It's just that the set dressing, you know, is feeling that, that again, that environmental pressure that, Jim McClure was talking about like that stress and then you know in there they talk about HPNS which is the high pressure nervous syndrome and then there's the bends and there's nitrogen narcosis and there's just all these things that people have like heard about but they're like oh do I need to worry about it to refer it back to what you were just talking about with your Roman example I don't know anything about Rome so I probably would choose not to run something in Rome for somebody who is a Rome expert right? That would probably be my first call. But then I'd also like, if I wanted to do it and kind of see, cause I was, I was interested in it and wanted to see what was different about it. Then I would put it in a small place. Like I would do a, a city, right. And, or like a, a town or the outskirts of a town or something like that, where I'm not having to deal with the politics of Rome, right. Or those kinds of big picture things that make my brain seize up. That's just not where my skills are. Same thing here. Take it, take it easy. Take it slow. Yeah, yeah. And like you guys were saying, take advantage of the elements of being underwater you want to take advantage of. If what you want is that alien feeling, there's good ways to do that and hand wave some other stuff. If you have an idea where the pressure of being underwater is a big component, then bring it in. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's hand wave what you want to hand wave and keep what you want to keep, just like you would – Anything else I think makes a ton of sense. Hey, everybody, wanted to let you know about today's sponsor, Audible.com. Thank you very much to them. Audible.com is offering a free audiobook and 30 day trial to listeners of Tabletop Babble. Uh, one audiobook I think you might love is Homeland Legend of Drizzt, book one, narrated by Victor Bavine and of course written by the one and only. Robert A. Salvatore. Uh, so check out that book. It's about everybody's favorite heroic dark elf, Drizdo Erden. Listen to his origin story. It is pretty awesome. To get your free audiobook and to start your free trial, go to audible.com slash DSPN. That's audible.com slash DSPN. All right, let's uh, jump back into this amazing conversation with Rich and Darcy. So... Now that we've sort of talked about how to get inspired and where you can get ideas and the sort of how it can inject new life into your game by bringing in some aquatic adventures, let's uh, let's have some fun. Let's talk a little bit about some things we can bring in, some elements that are truly aquatic that we don't get anywhere else. Like, Darcy, you know, I know you are all about the critters. You love the weird underwater creatures. So talk to me about some weird underwater creatures that uh, that I can use in my aquatic games that I can't use anywhere else. Oh, my God. This is the question I've been waiting to be asked all my life. Okay. We're going to start with colonial organisms, okay? I think something you don't see as much terrestrially is – gosh, where to start? Okay, I need to pick one. Let's start with – Hydrozoans. So hydrozoans are, you know, related to like jellyfish. They're little gelatinous critters. And there's a series of them that are not part of a single organism. They're not the cells of a single organism. They are individuals that can exist as, apart from it. But they form these big accretions um, and they sort of collect together and then they act more like one. So they become they, – they act as a colony, right? So they're really cool and really weird. The format that colonial organisms look like look very different from something that's, um, you know, a complex multicellular animal, right? And so, like, look up. I love Portuguese man of war. Look those up. They float at the top. They've got these little polyps, these little individual hydrozoans that that blow up like a balloon. So one individual is like the size of my, I don't know, my hand or something, and another individual that you know is is a totally different individual, probably genetically closely related to it could potentially become the float, the big balloon, that might change its form to be a little drooping tentacle. And these things are weird and blue and purple. So look up pictures of colonial hydrozoans. There are also, I think, siphonophores are freaking, I don't know what to do with siphonophores. Rich, if you can speak to siphonophores, that would help me out a lot. But they are terrifying and great. <laughs> right. I'm trying to find an analogy of what yeah. you're talking about that 
our fellow geeks will understand. <laughs> so think of, think about Voltron. <laughs> okay. So v- Voltron is five robots merged into one. Yep. Yeah. No, you're talking about the, the Zords from Power Rangers for people of another generation, but I got you. Absolutely. Right. So think about that, but there's like hundreds of them and they're all kind of different. They've performed different functions for the larger organism. So when you first look at it, it looks like it's one creature, but it's not. It's made up of some ungodly number of other creatures that are coming together to form the larger creature. (laughs) That's about the best description I can think of. So that's why they call them a colonial organism. It's a colony of creatures that end up working together to almost look like its own different, separate, larger creature. You're not getting that on the surface. I can't think of a single example of a surface colonial organism. There may be one, but I can't think of one at the moment. I think there's some weird plant stuff, but nothing like what you get with the marine life. And you shouldn't swim into the Portuguese man of war, right? Like that's one of the that's one of the things you're supposed no. to be on the lookout for if you're like right. swimming in the tropics. Yeah, their their stings are bad. Very bad. <laughs> May I throw in that also there's just raw size? Mm. So like I was talking earlier about you know, being out in the deep ocean where it's miles deep and there's no anything, that desert, right? Your kraken can be the size of a metropolis and nothing is going to stop you. The episode I just listened to of you guys talking about the Tarrasque, you think the Tarrasque is big. You could literally have a kraken like with a civilization living inside of its mantle. I'm doing it, stealing that. Mm -hmm. There is no size limit in the same way that you have on on land, right? We think the Tarrasque is big, but seriously, a kraken could put it to shame. I mean, that's part of the reason why the largest creature who's ever lived on earth is the blue whale, right? That's the reason why, you know, these land creatures that move into the water, it's why polar bears are so big. They're so big because regular bears moved into the water and the water can support the bulk and the size that they need. So, you know, size is just not a limit. It could be mind blowing what you're dealing with out there. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It's a place where things can be so huge and you could never know about them, right? Like what's what's at the bottom of the Mariana Trench? Uh, Maybe something terrifying, right? Only James Cameron knows for sure. (laughs) (laughs) If it passed by his camera. Darcy started with the colonial organisms, but I want to hear more because Darcy, Darcy's an invertebrate biologist and I'm more of a marine mammals vertebrate guy. So... (laughs) I love hearing what Darcy has to say and the stuff that just follow her on Twitter, everybody, (laughs) because the stuff that people send her and the stuff that she tweets out is pretty amazing. Oh, man. I, you know, I think things that play with light tend to be really exciting, too, that you get a much bigger diversity of in the water, right? So, uh, you know, I'll just look up anglerfish. Did you know there are like a million anglerfish and they're all horrifying in beautiful, unique ways? Rich probably knew that, but I just found out. There are so many freaking anglerfish. And they're all horrible. They're all so great. And, you know, so they've got these little fleshy protrusions from their horrible heads. And they've got these big mouths full of teeth. And the fleshy protrusion has a little light. uh, And so it sort of uses that light to lure prey into its big gaping jaws. Those are horrible and great. And the males attach onto the females and bite into her side. And they basically, you know, liquefy until they're just a little pair of gonads that stick onto the the body wall of this freaking mother anglerfish. Everything's horrible and wonderful in the ocean. So I love those. And and other light stuff, right? I think a cool effect that you should definitely not miss out on is phosphorescence or uh, like bioluminescence. You know, if you, your players are moving through the water in places that have little dinoflagellates or other little uh, critters like tenophores, if they're brushing up against some of these microscopic or, you know, very tiny organisms, they'll flash. It's like magical light is moving from your hand. It's like you're casting spells. It is the coolest thing. Look up some videos, but uh, experience it if you can. And so that's that's another effect that you would just, you know, you wouldn't get on land uh, that you should definitely take advantage of. I actually have a story related to that. Uh, I was lucky enough, I took a year off and I traveled around the world and I did some stuff that you guys have seen some photos on 
of online. Oh, wait, hold uh, on. I have a story about that. So um, <laughs> everybody should go to don't split the podcast network dot com and check out the show notes for this episode to see pictures of Rich Howard with super <laughs> long hair uh, tending to wild animals. It's like a romance novel cover, but real life. <laughs> it's incredible. Uh, Rich Howard is scientist Fabio. <laughs> scientist Fabio. Uh, okay, yes. Hashtag long hair Rich Howard. So in this particular story, so I'd spent about three months on a catamaran. I was sailing along the coast of Australia with some people, uh, and uh, we were sailing out into the open ocean to a place called the Rolly Shoals, which are these three atolls. Look them up. They're, it, they're it's stunning and great place to set adventures. But we we had to sail through the night, and so I was on watch one night when everybody else was sleeping, and I was wait, hang on, I need I need uh, some defining of terms. What is an atoll? Oh, sorry. So an atoll is an island or a, an island like structure that's actually formed of coral. So it's not the the earth like the bottom of the ocean coming up to form an island, like usually from a volcanic activity, kind of like Hawaii. It's actually a coral reef structure that's formed either into a solid island or in the case of the Rolly Shoals, they're actually, it's like a giant bowl. Think of a coral reef in a big circle, like a, like a wall around a city. And inside that circle is a giant bowl full of life. Anyway, so we we're on our way out and there was a new moon. So it was pitch black, pitch black beyond pitch black. Uh, sky full of stars and then the ocean was pretty flat and it was just all dark right and so i'm on the front of the boat and it's going through the night and we don't have engines where you it's a sailboat so it's pretty quiet and i'm just sitting on the front of one of the pontoons and i look off to the left and i see like nine comets like shooting through the night toward me and i'm like what is that <laughs> and it's so dark, I can't see what they are. It turns out they were a pod of dolphins that had come to ride the bow wake on the front of the ship. So I was sitting and looking down, but it was so dark, I couldn't see the dolphins in the water. All I could see were the streams of light pouring off of them like comets because of this effect that Darcy's talking about, the bioluminescence. And then one of them would like disappear and I'd hear a breath being taken and then it would splash back down into the water as it like jumped out of the water to like take a breath and then splash back in again. It was literally one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen in my life. And I just sat there and watched them for like 30 minutes while they were riding the bow wake and then they just took off. So that's an example of things that you can describe to people to give them that feeling of alienness that you're not really going to get to describe when they're like on a wagon between cities. So anyway, that was my example of what Darcy was talking about. That's great. So it sounds like there's a lot of weird real life critters uh, that are down there. What about like extinct and fantasy creatures? Because then we get even crazier, right? We, we get Megalodon, which is like a 50 foot long great white mm -hmm. shark um, that I think a lot of people are probably familiar with uh, thanks to the Discovery Channel's <laughs> fake documentary. <laughs> but, you know, I, there, there's so many other things in, in addition to your, your giant crocodiles, your giant sharks, your, your plesiosauruses. What else is there in this, in this fantasy world? We talked about the Kraken already. Uh, like, like what else can we play around with that isn't or that at least we think isn't in our ocean. There's a lot of weird things in the fossil record uh, that are still baffling as all get out. I recommend if you're into sharks, look up Helicoprion. It has a coiled mouthful of teeth. It's terrifying and the reconstructions of it look goofier and goofier. There's also the Burgess Shale fauna. So it's like a specific section of rock time period that we've discovered that has all sorts of weird, really early Cambrian life experiments, okay? And there are some pretty good artistic renditions of some of those now because we found some really well-preserved ones. So we're starting to figure out how, I mean, for a long time, we were getting little coiled bits and tentacly looking things and we couldn't figure out how they, they went together. Like they were just, I mean, up and down. No, no one could figure out where top is for this animal, right? They're just so perplexing. So things like uh, hallucinogenia and um, 
Anomalocaris, you know, because it's an anom- anomaly. That whole fauna, look up some creatures there. Look up trilobites. Those are gameable and darling and should be everywhere. And it's a tragedy that we don't have them anymore, <laughs> theoretically. But but also some of these things like the coelacanth. Coelacanth was, was thought yeah. to be extinct for I don't even know how long. And then sometime in the late 90s, I think. Was it the late 90s maybe, Darcy? Uh, yeah, or maybe 80s. It Japanese close, yeah. just started started finding them in their nets alive. <laughs> So yeah. you're like, uh, and they look like something out and of they, yeah. the ancient yeah. past. <laughs> they haven't changed. No, they're definitely like they're definitely putting their nets through a time portal under Japan somewhere and pulling these things out. I, I think that's kind of a theme of the ocean too, though. For me, is like, you know, there's the ocean as cradle where it's producing all these crazy diverse organisms, but it's it's the ocean as um, you know, sort of coffin or mausoleum too, right? Uh, you know, at the icy depths, you've got stuff that's sunk down and has found its own little weird hole and it's been existing outside of time and space and not interacting with the rest of the world for a long time. You know, you can preserve weird old shipwrecks or, you know, sunken cities and you can you can get a weird level of preservation in that way. And so I think uh, that's very gameable, right? You can be playing with themes of sort of ancient past, either, you know, creatures or people or uh, structures or like, you know, artifacts, right? Could be sitting down there just waiting to be uh, rediscovered. I, I mean, I think that idea of untouched ancient, it's a great way to bring together some like interesting civilizations too, right? Like I think if we think about Aquaman or if you think about Submariner, right? There's this idea of like, a civilization that is mere miles away that is entirely alien to us, which I think can also be a, a fun way to sort of separate places, you know, rather than than borders, right? You have like a whole body of water between you and also untouched by uh, time, you know, think about how long it took us to find the actual site of the Titanic, right? Bob Ballard didn't find that until well after it had sunk. And, you know, an adventure like that where you're scouring the sea for an ancient treasure or maybe for survivors, right? Like if, if they maybe they crashed like a spaceship crashed and its life support systems are still working and they still have enough food, but they have no way to communicate and we have no way to find them like that could be a really cool adventure. I'm starting to get excited listening to you guys talking about all this. What are some other, like, greater themes we can think about uh, when it comes to underwater? Like, what what are some things, obviously, we've talked about it being alien, we've talked about it being different. Darcy, you were talking about, like, the preservation of history. I think one thing that I would do is I tend to throw what I am scared of at my players and try to make them scared of it, too. Like Batman, you know? I think there's that idea of like, I can be scared of an underwater adventure, but if I can get over that and run it, it could be a really great tense adventure, just like Jim McClure was saying to you, Rich. So I think like fear of the unknown as part of that idea of alien is one of the great themes for underwater. Uh, What do you think, Rich? What are some good aquatic themes? Well, I have to I have to play off what you just said too because you actually get a double dose of that because if you can get your your players horrified at the table and stressed and worried at the table and then after the game you could say, "Oh, by the way, that's actually real in our world. Here's a picture of it." And then they can be extra terrified of the ocean, then you can kind of get the ride that rush, you know, twice. So on on Tribality, I did a series where I was breaking down trying to make it easy for people as much as possible to run underwater adventures. And so I, I went through and found all kinds of monsters that could be used in an aquatic setting and divvied them up by like challenge ratings, you know, you know, one to five, six to 10, 11 to 15, blah, blah, blah. And some creatures like undead creatures that you often don't think of as being aquatic creatures just simply because they don't have to breathe. And then I included a bunch of encounter seeds for all of those different kinds of creatures And then uh, when I got toward the end of the series, I realized, well, I have all these encounter seeds. I can string them together into campaign themes. So there's actually two full 20-level campaign skeletons for aquatic games. And they're not terribly unfamiliar. Like one of them is that, you know, the, the Aboleth that lost, you know, whatever their war was when they used to rule the world. Everybody thought they were dead. But really they're in a a trench 
they built a, a city and a civilization so deep down that most races can't even get down there, even aquatic ones. And they've been rebuilding their numbers and they're, they're plotting and planning and doing things to come out of that trench to, you know, take over the, the aquatic and potentially the surface world. I mean, that's a, the basic theme is the same as, you know, uh, an orc horde, you know, in a, in a valley like Red Hand of Doom or it can have this alien feel, but it doesn't mean that the themes of storytelling are going to be unfamiliar. Do you know what I mean? It just has a different dressing to it. What the location looks like, like maybe this giant dead kraken, you know, we were talking about with the, that's, that's, you know, the body's still animated by a necromancer and there's a civilization living inside of it, you know, that's horrifying. And something that could probably only really be done in an underwater setting but aside from that, the adventure that takes place inside it or what you have to do or the politics or that kind of stuff doesn't have to be that unfamiliar. You can still find the the kinds of adventures on the surface that you normally like to run and take those themes and tweak them a little bit. Um, but, you know, there's no reason why you can't just find a treasure map and and go in a dungeon crawl, right? Or a, or a dungeon swim or whatever you want to call it and go find it. I mean, you can just start with those things, you know, and build off those. I think that's right. And I think that's, that's true of anything, you know, that's, that's very true of whenever you're, you're sort of bringing a, a new environment in. We are running out of time here, um, which is a shame because I feel like we could talk about this uh, for days. So hopefully you both will come back and, and talk more, not just aquatic adventures with me, but av- adventures in general. You know, Darcy, I've been hearing rave reviews about a certain sort of, CW style cipher system superhero game you've been running. And I think, uh, you know, obviously Rich would be perfect to talk with about that as well. But before we go, any last thoughts about aquatic adventures? Uh, yeah, I have one recommendation, I guess. Go pick up a PDF copy of a book called Natural Selection for the Blue Planet role playing game science fiction setting. If you want an example of how to make something kind of horrifying without having to do a lot, take the creatures from there, from this alien world, and just translate them into whatever system you're running. And a lot of them aren't monster monsters like your party's going to fight, but there are this biology and ecology, this xenobiology they put into it is amazing. And one of the simplest things is the idea that on this planet, the complex eye that you and I have and a lot of animals have on Earth never developed So all of the creatures that live there, even just the normal creatures, like little rabbit analogs and whatever, they only have eye spots that detect light. So nothing has eyes, (laughs) which take, it's, it's amazing. And just the idea of like running into this like monkey analog that they kind of have on this planet that, you know, it turns around and it has no eyes. Like the idea of eyes are so key to human interaction, no matter what the creature is. So you can take that, and it doesn't mean that the monster's like more has more hit points or deals more damage. That's not what makes it horrifying. It just creates this extra environment of alienness that can twist things in a simple way. Go pick that up and put it in your game. Also, it's a fantastic supplement in general. Yeah, I guess um, that sounds amazing, and I need to read it. <laughs> uh, my little bit of advice is uh, first just, You will learn what you need to learn by just running an aquatic adventure for the first time. Like we can sit here and give you advice all day, but it is, it is not as hard. I was, I was really feeling overwhelmed and I didn't prep enough before I ran mine and it went fine. And I learned things I would do differently, but like your players are going to be, because there is so much fun stuff to do with it, even if it's a little bumpy, I think you're going to, you're going to leave your players with some really exciting things to, to remember um, even if it's, you know, not as smooth as you wanted it. So just try it, get out there and try it. And then, okay, so I've talked a lot about these horrible looking creatures that I love dearly. And I know not everyone is has this deep love for all things awful as I do. But one thing I would recommend is, you know, a lot of these creatures look horrible and are pretty docile or, you know, you know, play with the subverting expectations, right? Things that look very alien and uh, awful, but might be friendly or sentient or, um, you know, kind and helpful. Um, so I think yes. the ocean is a great chance to play with those expectations. Too. I absolutely back that. That's a fantastic idea, Darcy. I love it. I'm stealing, I'm stealing <laughs> that for sure. Good. <laughs> 
Well, thank you both so much for joining me on Tabletop Babble today. Uh, Rich Howard, where can people find you if they want to talk to you about the ocean or Aquaman or anything else? <laughs> yeah, you can find me on Twitter at Umbral Walker, U-M-B-R-A-L-W-A-L-K-E-R. Uh, you can find me also on uh, the Twitter for Whelmed, the Young Justice Files. That's at the YJ Files. You can find me on uh, Facebook as well. Um, you can email me at rich at richhowardauthor.com. And I probably have, I don't even know, 60, 70 articles on uh, aquatic gaming across a bunch of genres and types on tribality.com with my column from the depths. So if you want an idea for a full underwater campaign, I got a couple of them for you up there and a lot of inspiration for different genres as well. Awesome. And Darcy, where can people find you? Uh, people can find me. Uh, at Darcy L. Ross, D-A-R-C-Y-L-R-O-S-S, at most places, so Twitter and um, G+, and things like that. You can also find my podcast, uh, Cypher Speak, where I occasionally devolve into talking about oceany things as well, uh, at cypherspeak.com, which is a part of the Misdirected Mark uh, podcast network, so we love them, and they've got lots of great stuff there, too. Yeah, and I, I think most places you can find me at Darcy L. Ross or, you know, come to Chicago and come to the Field Museum or the Shedd Aquarium and we can talk shop. Excellent. Well, check out those places. And, of course, we'll link everything over in the show notes at don'tsplitthepodcastnetwork.com for this. Uh, thank you so much for joining me today, guys. Thank you so much. Dude, I had a wonderful time. Man, that was awesome. Those guys know so much about aquatic life and undersea. And uh, I actually do feel a lot better about running a game underwater. So thank you so much for that. I really, really appreciate it. You know, if you would like to support the show, one of the best ways to do that is to leave us a five-star review on iTunes or Stitcher or whatever your podcatching platform of choice is. And if you don't have a way to leave us a review on your podcatching platform of choice, go over to iTunes, create an account, and then leave us a review and all of the other podcasts you love. It's an easy way to support us, and it takes, like, less than two minutes. Uh, and, as a bonus... If you leave us a five-star review, I will read it on air. Make me say anything you want. Come on, people. What is better than that? Today's five-star review is from iTunes, and it comes from Kixaras. It is called Sharing in the Joy of Tabletop Gaming. Uh, Kixaras says... Uh, James Intracasso continues to crush the world of RPG podcasts with Tabletop Babble. His exuberance in sharing his hobby makes this a must-listen for both newbies and veteran gamers alike. Both groups will find something to aid in their gaming, from broad stroke general advice to crunchy hair-splitting minutia. Central to any discussion James has with his guests is a sense of excitement and fun, which is refreshing and makes this grizzled gamer smile with renewed desire to roll dice. Uh, Kixaras, just so people know, was influential in, uh, in making me a, a gamer and a storyteller and uh, sharing my love of great, fantastic stories uh, and fart jokes. Uh, so thank you so much, Kixaras. You know, people, uh, if you want to support the show financially, there's a way to do it that doesn't cost you anything extra. Go to don'tsplitthepodcastnetwork.com, click on the banners on the left for Amazon or Drive Through RPG before you shop on those sites, and then we get a few pennies on the dollar. It costs you nothing extra, but throw some money our way. Go there, bookmark those links, and then use them whenever you shop. It will be super easy and help us out a bunch. So thank you to everybody who has been doing that. And I also want to take a minute to recommend a great show on the Don't Split the Podcast Network, Venture Maidens. Uh, this is an all-female actual play that has some amazing storytellers. It is some of the best D&D &D you will be able to hear or see because we broadcast it every time live on the Twitch Don't Split the Podcast streaming channel uh so go check that out venture maidens they are awesome thank you so much to them for joining us here on don't split the podcast network uh which is a network that also hosts this podcast tabletop babble and i founded with rudy basso the theme music which you're listening to right now was provided by battle bar 
Don't forget that RPGs are like sex. As long as everybody's having fun, you're doing it right.